to talk about the journey that malt takes on its way to the mill um, and a little bit about malt milling as well. So we're going to touch on malt intake into the brewery, malt dust, dressers, magnets, the stoners, mills and grist assessments. So as the malt enters the brewery, there are a few things we need to be aware of. First, we need to make sure the moisture level does not increase. We don't want it to get wet. Keeping it the same moisture basically discourages pest activity and any biomechanical changes that could happen to the malt. Different things can affect the moisture level, such as the weather conditions on intake, bags being stored in high moisture areas, such as by hot liquor tanks and kettles, uh, work kettles, as long as wash down water. When we're offloading bulk deliveries, the malt can be tipped using a conventional tipper or blown into the silo. The blower creates more dust that can build up over time and the silos may need cleaning more often. And the, the silos are also designed to have a smooth walls and conical base, making it easier for grain removal. We need to ensure stock rotation. It's good practice to empty the silo before refilling. It maintains maintain stock management and traceability. The measurements for the weighers and the load cells have a small percentage of error. This quickly builds up, making predicted stock levels inaccurate. You only truly know how much is in a silo when it's empty. When you're using bags, use the oldest bag first and make sure they're in date. Before, in, before offloading or using malts, especially the older malts that are older or have been open for a while, you, you trust in the malts to deliver it as per specification, but check it before use. And again, if you use an older malt or bags that's open, you really need to have a look at it. So if we split the defects that we can see in malt into visual and sensory, when we're having a look at the malt, we can see if it's broken or damaged, if you're using whole malt. Any untypical colouring, is it all the same colour? Any foreign bodies, bodies such as dirt and insects or mould and fungi? And then the sensory or aroma, it's mouldy aromas, rancid aromas or butyric aromas, which is baby sick. The kettle test helps to bring out these defects. You can add 200 gram of grain, it can be whole or crushed to boiling water and leave it for 15 minutes. By this time it should be cold enough to handle, but do take care. Sieve the grain away and then assess the remaining liquid for the flavour and the aroma. Malt dust can affect our health. It, it, it poses an explosion risk and can harm my respiratory system. I'm not going to go into huge detail because it's pretty deep. I'm just going to raise the basics. I've put links to the HSC website if you need further information on any of these. When malt dust is in the presence of oxygen, it creates an explosive atmosphere. It only takes a spark to cause the explosion. The disease regulations requires employers to eliminate or control any risks. To reduce the risk of explosion, malt dust should be kept to a minimum by a good GMP, which is good manufacturing practice. ATEC zones is dependent on the risk of explosion. So mills produce dust in the presence of oxygen for long periods, so are higher risk than say sack tippers, so they have different zoning. The zone area will dictate what electrical items can be used. So sparks from electric items can cause explosions, keep them away. Also, we also remove stones and metal objects that can cause sparks. Inhaling dust can damage the mucous membrane and cause long-term respiratory damage. So make sure you've got the correct grade of dust mask, and make sure it fits. Base fitting ensures correct fit, but you must be freshly sha shaven to make sure that it's effective. This slide shows the process flow of a bagging line at Great Rybra. Um, from the storage bin, the malt passes through several different processes before it can be milled. So we'll go into these in a little bit more detail. 
Remote screens, addresses, they're essentially big sieves. They can be rotating cylindrical or oscillating flatbed screens. For consistency, for, consist sorry, for consistent milling, we need consistent grain size. As the grain passes over the screen, small grains are removed. If allowed to stay, they may pass through the mill hole. Grain is also a natural product that contains straws and string. The dresser removes them. We've mentioned that metal can cause sparks, but they can also cause damage to the mill. Magnets are placed over the dresser outlet or mill inlet and need to be cleaned. Over time, debris can collect and make it inefficient or cause blockages. Mop flows over the magnets in a thin layer for efficiency. Stones the same size of malt will pass through the dresser, so we need a distoner to remove them. The grain bed is fluid as air passes through it. The bed is set at an angle and shakes, making dense, heavy objects move uphill. So, why do we mill? We basically want maximum extract as quick as possible. To do this, we need to reduce the particle size and also control it. Large, coarser grits give faster filtration with reduced extract. Small, finer grits give slow filtration with increased extract. Follow on from Carl's presentation on C of A's, there are a few parameters that affect how we mill. It's important to keep the grain size relative, con, con, relatively consistent to keep the milling consistent. The grain size varies on cereal and variety. For instance, wheat can be different size to malted barley. The grown season also has a big impact on the grain size. We can see from the table below, the 2019 crop, which, a normal, which was a more normal growing season, has larger grains than the 2018 crop that suffered drought. Also, best ale is larger than Maris Otter in both years. Milling torrified pro flakes products can lead to poor work separation and clarity issues, so don't mill them, add them after the mill. The malt friability is a measure of how well the malt is modified and how easy, easily it can be milled. Some malts from the continent and parts of the UK have friability of around 80%. Ideally, it should be above 90. Well modified malts produce fine grits and only need simple milling, while unmodified malts produce coarse grits and require more complex milling solutions. Because of this, blending under modified malts with well modified malts will produce different particle sizes. Malt mills are specially designed to keep the husk, the husk integrity. The husks form part of the filter bed and help maintain bed porosity for faster filtration. Low husk volumes can extend filter times in the brew house along with bright beer filtration. They can also produce poor wort quality, resulting in poor beer quality and potential fermentation issues. If extracted, Polyphenols and husk can also cause astringent bitter flavours and have a negative effect on the shelf life. Like all things in brewing, there's a little bit of science to milling. When we crush the grain, we're applying direct compression and shear forces. As the grain passes through the rollers, it's compressed. This disrupts the grain structure, producing different particle sizes. If the rollers run at different speeds, it will produce shear forces to the grain structure. Adding a fluted surface to the roller intensifies the cutting action. Efficiency, capacity of a mill is controlled by its roller length, roller speed, roller gap, and the roller surface. So we come on to the different types of mills now. I'm going to concentrate on roller mills, as these are the most common. The simplest form is the two roller mill. It's got a single set of rollers and is relatively low cost. It's best used with well modified malts and suited to the single infusion mash tun. 
They're fairly easy to use and to set up. Four roller mills are a little bit more complex and have double sets of rollers. They're for use with well modified malts, but can cope with lesser modified malts as well. They're suited to single infusion mash tons or lauter tons. The second set of rollers break up any hard, hard ends, hard unmodified ends, sorry. In standard mills, the flour and grits produced by the first set of rollers pass on to the second set for further crushing. In more sophisticated mills, like in the top diagram, there's a revolving beater after the first set of rollers that divert the husks, fine grits and flour away from the second set of rollers. The six roller mill is even more complex and has three sets of rollers. It's suitable for all kinds of malts and it's more effective at controlling each grist fraction. They're generally used in bigger breweries running Lauterton's and mash filters. Flour from the first rollers goes direct to the grist case while fine grits are screened to the bottom rollers. Husks and coarse grits from the first set of rollers are sent to the second set of rollers. Husks and flour are then sent to the grist case, while the grits are sent to the bottom set of rollers. So in summary, not all mills are equal, and malt mills are specifically designed to protect the husk. As the number of rollers increase, so does the ability to control each grist fraction and mill and modified malts. With more rollers comes greater complexity and cost in both capex and running costs. If the maltster is doing a poor job, ultimately the brewer needs to spend money on more complex milling equipment. It doesn't really matter what mill you've got, you need to check the grist fractions. They can help predict poor yeast, sorry, <clears throat> predict poor extract, poor filterability, clarity issues and fermentation issues. The plant sifter uh, splits the grist into several different fractions and is highly accurate, allowing you to dial in the mill, but it's a little bit overkill and expensive. The standard grist separator box has two sieve sizes, one at 1.98 mil and one at 0.212 mil to separate the grist into husks, coarse grits and flour. Grist assessment is fairly straightforward. You need to take a representative sample from the mill and place about 100 gram in the grist box. Put the lid on it and shake it from side to side for two minutes. Weigh the separate fractions from each box. Add up all the weights for the total and then divide each separate layer by the total weight to get the percent fraction and make sure you record the results. Once you've got the grist fractions, you can compare them to the recommended levels. The crisp crush is optimized for the single infusion mash ton, but also gives excellent results on mash louters. The louter figure is for traditional louter tons with height adjustable raking. Optimizer for mash louters may need somewhere in the middle. The distilling fractions give maximum extracts without worrying about clarity. And we also mill coloured malt slightly coarser to improve filterability. The current settings for Bastille and Marisotta for our Beulah four roller mill is 1.6 millimetre at the top and 1.5 millimetre at the bottom. Ultimately, the grist fractions are guidelines. And if you've got the ability to mill, then you find the right spec to make your equipment run properly it's all about playing a tune and making your brewery sing when it is time to make any changes to the mill make small adjustments of just 0.1 millimeter at a time make the gap smaller for finer grists and wider for coarser grists 
on a four roller mill, are just both rollers by the same distance. And as a general guide, set the top roller 0.1 millimeter above the bottom roller. You can double check the gaps using a feeler gauge across the whole length of the roller. As the rollers wear, and sorry, as rollers age, they do wear. And it can make a gap size inconsistent as they can wear away more in the middle. If you do make any changes, make sure you record them. If you have any issues, it helps on troubleshooting. And if you do need any help or advice, then give us a shout. We're here to help and offer, serve, offer advice and practical help. It's just part of the service that we do provide. So we've got a little bit of a table here now with whole versus crushed malt with some pros and cons. So on whole malt, pros being that the brewer's in control of his crush and it can really dial in the different fractions to make the brewery work really, really well. You get the possibility for big bag as you expand and you can really reduce your health and safety, your manual loading. And you don't have to pay the crushing fee. The cons, it's obviously a higher capital cost. You've got a little bit more health and safety to worry about because you're producing dust. You've got to pay for maintenance. You've also got to find the time to do the sampling to make sure that it's right. And you may or may not need a dresser or a distoner. With crushed malts, the pros are there's no capital cost. There's no possibility of cross-contamination with colour as well. There's no maintenance. And then the cons, you're reliant on the supplier to guarantee the crush. And you're going to pay £20 a ton more. On shelf life, the vast majority of bagged malt consumed within a week is sold to the customers. So they're always getting fresh grain. We're in the middle of, middle of a study comparing whole malt shelf life versus crushed. And we're six months in without seeing too much difference. As soon as that comes out in the next six months, we'll publish that and everyone can see exactly what happens. So we often get asked, what's the difference in extract between the 0.7 mil lab grinds and the grind for the brewery? So we've tested some samples. As expected, it's lower, but it is quite impressive at less than 4% of the original extract. So on the extra pale, as is through the 0.7 mil, um, mil, 7, .7 mil, mil in the lab, it's 298, and then through our four roller mill, it's 291. <clears throat> Best ale is 298 against 290, and Otter is 300 against 297. So they're really, really impressive. And then we finish with a little bit of a troubleshooting guide. There's a lot of information in the table, so I'm not going to go through it step by step. But if you are having issues, have a look at it or print it out and put it on the wall for when you do get any issues. And as always, we're, here to, we're always here to help, so do get in touch. It's not wasting our time, and we do love doing it. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope that was of interest.